So good afternoon, everybody. We will continue with the, our meeting. And now I want to call Dr. Jose Manuel Llanes from the Aquaculture Genetics and Genomics University. So, yeah, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, Bento and Heije, for the, for the nice uh, reception here. It's good, uh, it's good to be here in Brazil again and see some uh, good friends and good collaborators. Um, and the topic that I'm, I'm going to cover now is uh, uh, my, my main field of uh, research, which is uh, related with aquaculture and uh, biotechnology, but with a strong emphasis on genetics and, and genomics. <clears throat> this is a, the, the, the outline of the presentation. So I will give uh, some, some reasons of, of, of the increasing importance of aquaculture in the world. Uh, I will give a brief overview of global aquaculture as well. I will talk something, a uh, couple of things about aquaculture in Chile and also Brazil. Um, what are the main challenge, challenges for aquaculture now? Related to, to biotech, right? Because there are other, other kind of challenges related to engineering and different, different uh, areas. But I will focus on, on biotechnology challenges. And uh, I will also give some examples and of, of in the advances in terms of genetics and genomics in aquaculture species, uh, with emphasis in uh, sal salmon and trout, but also I will talk something about uh, tilapia, Nile tilapia. <coughs> and uh, I will give, uh, at the end I will give a kind of a vision of uh, how, is, where, how are the, the, the future, future steps in, in, in this field. So to start, the, why uh, aquaculture is increasingly important, I will give you just three reasons. Uh, I will not trying to convince, convince you that uh, to move to, to aquaculture field, right? But uh, I, will, I will give you three, three important reasons that uh, explain why aquaculture is uh, increasingly important. As we, uh, uh, as Rafael mentioned yesterday, Rafael from FAO, we need to produce uh, more food with limited uh, land, land uh, availability, right? So there will be an increasing demand of food uh, related to the population growth, uh, and land is becoming a scarce, uh, a scarce resource. And uh, on the other hand, the planet Earth, right, uh, is uh, covered 70 percent by, by by water in the surface. So why do we call it Earth, right? Uh, uh, should we call it water? Uh, so this. Uh, and why not moving our production systems to the water, right? If we have uh, uh, plenty of water surface in the, in, in the earth, we could move our, our, our food, food production systems to the water, right? Um, the second reason is that uh, aquaculture is highly efficient compared to other animal production uh, activities. Uh, in terms of, uh, for example, protein retention, energy retention, feed conversion rate, and uh, edible meat is uh, uh, 
much, much higher than other protein sources, uh, animal protein sources like chicken, uh, uh, pigs, and, and cattle. And the third reason is that if we want to eat fish in the future, we cannot rely only in, in, in wild captures. Uh, wild, wild captures are uh, stagnant over 30 years, uh, or since 30 years, because of over-exploitation of the oceans. So if we want to keep uh, eating fish, we will have to uh, find additional or alternative uh, ways of, uh, of producing fish. And this is, this is a, a graph which is showing the increase in aquaculture, farm fish, right, in terms of uh, metric tons per year. And this is uh, uh, the, the, the trend of uh, wild captures. So wild captures stabilize, are stab stabilized at, at some point. And aquaculture started to increase since uh, 1980s, and it is still increasing. Well, an overview of the global aquaculture. Uh, this is like the big picture of uh, global aquaculture. So the, the main increase in, in, in fish protein is given by farm, farm fish. As I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, the wild fish is, uh, is uh, stagnant. So there's not increase in, 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 in production of, of, of wild fish. But farm, farm fish uh, is, uh, has increasing very, very rapidly. Actually, in 2011, 2012, uh, the protein production from farm fish surpassed, surpassed the protein production from beef cattle. Okay, so now we produce more uh, protein from farm fish than from cattle in the world. And this was recently during this uh, early this d uh, decade. Okay. These are the data from FAO, hmm? official, official data. <clears throat> Basically, there are two kinds of aquaculture. So we have uh, uh, inland aquaculture and uh, marine aquaculture. These are two examples. For example, this is an inland tilapia farm in Ecuador uh, using excavated ponds uh, and f in fresh water, of course, or, 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 or moderately salty waters. And uh, this is an example of a salmon farm in Chile, which is a marine or coastal uh, kind of aquaculture. So continental aquaculture or inland aquaculture is almost the double than uh, marine aquaculture. And Brazil has a lot of potential for continental for inland aquaculture. And it's the, the, area, the, the, the sector of uh, aquaculture that grows more rapidly. So, uh, the message is that, that there are a lot of opportunities for Brazil uh, to increase uh, production of, of fish uh, species, hmm? freshwater fish species. What are the main species in the world? So we have uh, carps here with the 58% uh, mainly produced by, by China, Asia. We have uh, some other freshwater uh, species like uh, you produce here native native fish species tambaki uh, paku and uh, other other important fish uh, fish native fish species Sh uh, shrimps and prawns represent the 9% tilapia is the 8% salmon and trout 6% uh, of the global uh, aquaculture freshwater crustaceans 4% and seawater pelagic uh, fishes 1% so marine aquaculture is still in, in, in uh, developing. In terms of the key players in the world, we have uh, here in the left-hand side the top 10 producers in terms of volume. So we have China here, by far the most important uh, world producer of farm fish, uh, mainly, mainly carps and freshwater fish. And all of the rest of the important countries, top eight important countries are uh, from Asia, China, Indonesia, India, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, Blank Bangladesh, Korea, and then uh, in the eighth uh, place uh, appears Norway with uh, about a little bit more than a million tons uh, per year. Then Chile uh, from South America and Egypt from, from Africa. 
So it's mainly, basically, uh, the worldwide aquaculture is produced in Asia. There are some important players in other places in the, in the world, but mainly Asia. But if we take this uh, to value, and in terms of exports, uh, the, 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 gra the graph uh, or the plot is still, China is still dominating in terms of value. But then Norway came to the second place, and we have other uh, Asian countries, then USA, Chile, uh, India, Denmark, Netherlands, and Canada. This is in terms of exports. So <clears throat> why Mo Norway and Chile appear here in the, in, in, in the, in the top 10, and, or they go up uh, uh, some, some, some places in, in, this, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this ranking? And it's uh, mainly because they produce uh, high-value products like salmon, and uh, some other countries produce uh, shrimps, which are uh, very, I mean, uh, they have a higher value than, than other uh, aquaculture species. Brazil is, the, uh, is in the 15th place with, uh, in, the, in the worldwide production with uh, uh, 562,000 tons per year. Regarding the aquaculture in South America, the two key players are Chile and Brazil. Uh, so I will talk something about, about Chile and why aquaculture is so important in Chile. So uh, this, is the, the, this is the country located in the map. But, uh, it's, it's very long and very narrow, right? We're here in South America. Uh, the Argentinian says that we are almost following into the, into the sea. Uh, because it's a uh, it's very narrow uh, and, and long country with a lot of uh, um, hills. It's very hilly. We have the Andes Mountains in the in the in the east, so we don't have too much surface to produce food, right? As, uh, that's a big difference with Brazil. Uh, in the north, even even worse. In the north, is almost uh, everything is desert, right? We cannot uh, uh, cultivate any crop in in the north part. In the central, central part, uh, is, uh, it's very good for fruit production and wine production. And in the south, it's mainly salmon production. We have a lot of channels and fjords and uh, water temperatures that are, are appropriate for salmon farming. So this uh, means that the main product for export in Chile is uh, aquaculture products, is salmon and trout. If we see the key exports for agribusiness in Chile, we have salmon and trout, which is the, the most important product. And then we have some forestry, like cellulose and wood, and some fruits, uh, like grapes, apples, cherries, and of course, wine. But uh, there is, a, there is a, a high importance of aquaculture, uh, mainly sal uh, salmon aquaculture in Chile. These are the statistics uh, of the Chilean uh, aquaculture growth during the, 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 the last years. Uh, they started at the early 80s. Uh, we produce basically three species, Atlantic salmon, Pacific salmon, one species of Pacific salmon called coho salmon, and rainbow trout. Mm. So the, the, the production started to increase rapidly. Something interesting here is that uh, none of these species are native from the southern hemisphere. So we basically took Atlantic salmon from Norway, Pacific salmon from, from the North America, and rainbow trout also from North America, and we started to, to, to farm this fish, and now we are, uh, we are competing, right? Uh, we are the, the second largest producer of salmon uh, in the world, uh, just uh, behind uh, Norway. So, so that's, that's a very, very particular of this production. Here we had a crisis that affected salmon industry in 2007, between 2007 and 2010, uh, caused by uh, an outbreak, huge outbreak of one viral disease called infectious salmon anemia. And uh, after that, the industry recovered very rapidly and uh, reached uh, uh, high levels of, of, of production of, of this, uh, this species. So these are anadromous fish. That means that they have uh, one stage of the life cycle is, is, is performed in, in fresh water, and then they are moved with trucks to seawater conditions. So it's almost two years of 
production, one year in, in, in fresh water, and the second year in, 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 the sea, in sea water. Um, even for rainbow trout, we have an anadromous rainbow trout, which is called as a steelhead, it's, it's called as a steelhead rainbow trout in, 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 the, in the supermarkets. We also produce uh, mussels. We're the first exporter of mussels in the world uh, with different uh, target markets, mainly Europe. Uh, we are the second largest producer of, of mussels. The production at some point in 2011 was stabilized, but still uh, mussels are a very important industry for, for, for aquaculture in Chile. If we come here to Brazil, you have uh, more continental or inland aquaculture than marine aquaculture, as it is shown here. Uh, the, con the marine aquaculture is not increasing that much. These uh, statistics are, are not too updated, but it, it is what, what I found in the, in the, in the literature. Um, but continental or inland aquaculture has increased uh, considerably during the last years. The main species, tilapia, which is an introduced species, is not native from here. Uh, tambaki, tambacu, which is an hybrid between tambaki and pacu. Carpa and pacu. Those are the fi uh, top, top five species farmed here in, in, in Brazil. If you see tilapia, it's an interesting uh, example. I don't know if I call it example, but it's an interesting case. You have a 130 percent increase of production between 2009 and 2011. So uh, this is happening in all, in, in all the, in the rest of the world, right? Tilapia production is increasing, but, uh, and, and Brazil is, is a key player in tilapia production hmm? with a lot of potential. So it's uh, an interesting species, species to, to target. What are the main challenges in aquaculture uh, related to biotechnology? I divided uh, in four, four different points. We are tackling with multiple, multiple species. Uh, that needs understanding on different species biology. For example, we, some, some people work with the fish, some other people would work with the mussels, mollusks. So different species means uh, a complex uh, uh, biology mm, and differences in bi biology. There are differences in production systems. We have freshwater and seawater uh, systems, for example. So that's also another complication. The domestication and selective breeding is also something uh, very, very important. Uh, some species are, are only early, or are only in, in, only in the early domestication stage. Um, and some other not, are not domesticated at all. Some, some farmers, take fish from, from the wild and they, 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 uh, they produce in cages but uh, with no domestic, domesticated fish. And uh, a report in, 2005, in 2011 indicated that only 10%, uh, I'm sorry, only 10% of the, of the total production in aquaculture come from animals that are genetically improved. So we have 90% to uh, animals that are not genetically improved. So there is a lot of uh, work to do from, uh, for, for, uh, for breeders in this, in, this, in, this, in this regard. In terms of disease control, it's obvious that aquatic environment allows uh, a, 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 a more complex disease tra transmission uh, schemes. Uh, also, also uh, the treatment with drugs is complicated. Uh, you can imagine that uh, if you have an outbreak of a bacterial disease, you have to treat the animals with antibiotics, and that in an aquatic environment is hard to control, so it's, it's another problem for the, for the industry. Another problem is that the, the scientific community is quite, uh, is quite small compared to other, to other species. For example, in, in dairy cattle or beef cattle, there are a lot of scientists working in the field uh, in only one, one species, right? But here we have different species with different biology, and uh, there is a scarce knowledge on the immune systems and pathogens. That means that, for example, we have one bacteria in Chile, which causes the main mortalities in the three species, and we have 33 commercial vaccines for that bacteria, but none, none of them work uh, properly. Because the immune system is, 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 is not, is not well, well, uh, well studied, and, and we don't know almost anything about the, 
the immune response in, in fish. Hmm? And uh, not, not to mention climate change, right? Uh, the temperature and, and CO2 increasing in the, in the water uh, resources. It's going to cause an effect, especially for cold water uh, species like salmon. And also it will, uh, it will bring some uh, emerging diseases. Hmm? This is a picture from a sea cage in, 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 in Panama. Uh, there is a, there is a, there is a a guy taking fish here. Uh, it's a cobia, cobia producer. Uh, here it's called bijupira, it's a marine, marine species. In terms of the advances in genetics and genomics, uh, some of the things that I'm, I'm going to talk uh, about here are in, are in this review that is going to be released in the next days. These are the proof pages of, the, of, the, of this review which cover the advances in genetic improvement for salmon and trout uh, in, in aquaculture in, in Chile. Uh, so most of the things that I'm going to talk ab about here are in this review if you want to check the details or if you want to go to the, to the specific literature. This is the situation for the breeding programs in Chile. Uh, Chile is considered as a pioneer in breeding programs in aquaculture. We started uh, very early in 1992 with a national breeding program for coho salmon. Uh, then in 1997, some companies started breeding programs for the three species, coho, that means Pacific salmon, Atlantic salmon, and rainbow trout. So we have uh, different breeding programs for the different species. Uh, some of them are controlled by, 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 by producers, and some others are controlled by genetic, uh, genetic houses, hmm? like uh, Hendrix or uh, EW Group which are also in, in poultry and pigs and, and cattle. Um, the breeding goal and selection cr criteria for salmon is uh, basically the, the, the trait that it's, uh, it's a must to have in, 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 to have in the breeding goal is uh, growth rate, increased growth rate, which is easily, easily measured as uh, harvest weight on each individual. That means that we can apply BLAP selection, best liner and vice predictor selection, very easily in this fish. But we have also a series of characters or of traits that are here in red that are also important from the economical point of view that uh, cannot be directly measured in the selection candidates. So we relied on SIP testing to uh, evaluate or to phenotype the, these, these traits. These traits are related with increased survival, resistance to specific pathogens, and also carcass quality trait, meat color, fillet yield, and fat content and fat composition. This is working. Selective breeding in, in aquaculture is working. It's not only working, but it's, it's working very good. We have uh, genetic gains, uh, or the genetic gains reported for body weight or for, for growth rate uh, are about 10% in different species. So, uh, much, much higher than the genetic gains that, uh, that uh, breeders can achieve in, in, in other species. These are the results from 10, almost 10 generations, I don't remember well, 8 to 10 generations in, in, a, in a brood stock, a, a breeding population of response. Uh, the bigger fish uh, mean, means the, 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 the most color uh, uh, of the flesh. Hmm? And uh, if you consider 10% of, of genetic gain per generation, and in 10 generations you, do you double the size of the fish, or you, 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 you decrease the, the growing phase uh, in a half. Hmm? So that's a, a big impact for, for, for the industry. And this is already implemented, right? The, the breeding programs are already implemented, and the, produ the producers know that, 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 that the fish uh, uh, are, are growing much, much faster. If you buy some eggs that are not improved, they are cheaper than imp uh, genetically improved eggs. Uh, there is a market uh, difference there. But uh, what about the traits that are difficult to measure for in the selection candidates? We relied on SIP testing, and this uh, kind of family-based selection uh, represent uh, decreased EBB securities. Uh, and there is also a trade-off between selection intensity and inbreeding because we can only exploit uh, between family selection and that this is related with a limited 
uh, genetic progress. This is mainly uh, the case for disease resistant traits and also for carcass quality traits. But now with the technology, we have pedigree data, we have phenotypes, right? With, this, with SNP technology, we could implement genomic selection, estimating marker effects, training the populations, and predicting uh, the genetic merit in, in, in the candidates based on the full SIP information and based on genotypes. That sounds easy, right? It's, 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 it's all more root, routine in, 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 in other terrestrial species. And that, uh, that is called genomic selection or genomic predictions, which increase the EBB accuracies, will increase the response to selection, and also will accelerate the genetic progress. But for that, that sounds very easy, right? We need a genotyping uh, platform, right? Uh, a routine geno genotyping platform. But for salmonids, but, but uh, some time ago, that, that was not available. Hmm? We started to think about this in 2010, when genomic selection was already implemented in cattle, in cattle, and we were looking to have a similar platform for fish. Another problem, another issue is that fish geno genomes, especially salmonid genomes, are complex, are very complex. The size of the salmon genome is uh, three gigabases, so it's similar to bovine or humans. They have 29, chrom 29 chromosomes, which may be variable within the species due to gross uh, rearrangements, fusion and inversion. So the same species, different numbers of chromosomes. Uh, the, cr the genome is highly repetitive. Almost 60% of the genome is, is repetitive elements, so the, the assembly is, is, was quite complex. Uh, and they are also pseudo tetraploids. They have uh, an event of uh, ancestry uh, duplication of the genome, uh, ancient duplication of the genome. So that difficult the SNP uh, discovery because we have uh, paralogous sequence variants and also multi site variants, which are not SNPs. True SNPs are uh, differences in, di in different duplicated genes. Chile. Canada and Norway established a consortium to sequence the salmon genome, the Atlantic salmon genome, that ended up in this, uh, in this article published in Nature in 2000 and, oh, 2017. And uh, this paper, the story of the paper is, uh, is about the redeploidization. It, it tells a story about the, um, the neo-functionalization of duplicated genes. After this uh, reference genome, there were a series of different salmonid genomes published in different uh, journals. So now we have this genomic resource, which is uh, crucial to, to, to discover SNPs and to generate uh, genotyping platforms. So with this information, SNP chips started to, to uh, came up, hmm? or came up. For Atlantic Salmon, we developed uh, two versions of a SNP panel, one 150K and another 50K, using Affymetrix or now Thermo Fisher technology, uh, sequencing a series of, 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 of fish. That time we sequenced, uh, we did some whole genome resequencing of 20 fish to cover some genetic variation, and we printed two, two versions of, of a SNP array that is uh, this SNP array, the 50K is already uh, being used by, by the industry in, in routine uh, genomic evaluation. Mm. The USDA generated a similar tool for rainbow trout uh, using uh, a source of SNPs from RATSIC experiment and also de novo whole genome sequencing. And together with a consortium between Chile and Canada, uh, we also developed two versions of uh, 220K and 70K SNP arrays for, for Pacific salmon. So now we have the tools, we have the, the SNP chips for all the species, and uh, when we had this information, we started to, to use them to, to generate more, more information about the biology and also the inc increase the genetic progress uh, for this species in economically re resistant, uh, economically uh, important traits. I'm going to talk about something about 
uh, the application of these SNP arrays in terms of the resist disease resistant traits. Uh, we have two main diseases in Chile. One is caused by uh, intracellular bacteria called uh, PC rickettsia salmonis, which generates the salmon rickettsia syndrome, uh, which is basically a pathogen that, that generate, produce high mortalities in, 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 in seawater stage of fish. And we also have a sea lice, a species of sea lice called Caligus roger cresegi. It's an ectoparasite that causes injuries, decreased performance, and also facilitates the entrance of other pathogens. So we do uh, SIP testing to train the populations or to get the phenotypes in an experimental station, a research station. We use challenge tests. We, 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 we take some fish from the, from the brood stock, sip, sip, siblings from the brood stock and uh, from the candidates of selection, and we challenge them to get the phenotypes. We, have, uh, we started estimating genetic parameters to see if this, uh, these traits were uh, uh, or presented genetic, uh, genetic variation. These are the heritabilities for uh, the bacterial resistance in the three different species. Uh, moderate, uh, low to moderate uh, heritabilities for all, the, for all the species, the same trait. And these are the heritabilities, low heritabilities for the resistance against this, uh, this parasite in two species. Why uh, we, we don't use uh, coho salmon here for the ectoparasite? Because coho salmon is highly resistant, naturally resistant. So uh, it's, very, it's, it's very interesting that two species from the same genus, Oncorhynchus, uh, rainbow trout, and coho salmon, they're from the same genus, they are differentially, they respond differentially against the sea lice. After that, uh, this is, these are plots from the phenotypes. What you have here is the, in the X axis, you have different families, 120 families, and the parasite counting. So you can have the average, there is var variation in terms of the average of parasite counting on each of the, of each of the family. And this is the survival uh, of uh, different families, the best family and the worst family. And this is the average across the 120 families uh, for the bacterial resistance. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge test in this case uh, spanned 40 days. And uh, with this information, we took samples from uh, 2.5 K fish from each experiment, uh, 2,500 fish from each experiment, and we genotype all of these fish with phenotypes. We perform GWAS, and uh, we basically uh, found that the two traits, the bacterial resistance and the parasite resistance, were uh, uh, mainly polygenic. We found some QTLs, small effect QTLs, two QTLs for, for the bacterial resistance, but uh, but they were of uh, moderate effect. Then uh, we move forward to evaluate genomic selection, genomic predictions in the three species for the bacterial resistance. And you can see here the three papers for, for, the, for each of the species with different uh, genotyping platforms, different, different biology, of course. Uh, we measure the trait as day of death and also binary survival and we compared uh, the, the, the traditional pedigree blab against different methods, uh, GBLAB, Basin Lasso, Bay C, in the case of Atlantic Salmon, the case of Rainbow Trout, we, use, we compared PBLAB, pedigree blab, against Basin Lasso, GBLAB, and Bay C. And the uh, Coho Salmon, we uh, compared uh, PBLAB against single step GBLAB, GBLAB, and Bay C. So we used different methods and uh, the norm was that for every method and for, for, for all of the traits, the uh, incorporation of genomic information increased the accuracy of selection uh, for, genomic, uh, for, for this uh, particular disease in the three species. Mm -hmm. These are demonstrative results. The industry is already using this, this data. They are selecting fish uh, to resist this, this, uh, this disease, uh, this bacterial disease using the platforms that we generated for them. 
We also, it's also nice to, to test or to compare different, uh, different uh, genetic bases or genetic architectures for the, for the same trait in different species. Here are the Bayesian uh, genome-wide association studies for the three species, again, for coho salmon, uh, rainbow trout, and Atlantic salmon for the two uh, trait definitions, day of death, I'm sorry, binary survival and day of death. And we did a comparative genomic analysis. We tried to, tried to get similar, uh, or we, we, we tried to, found, to find uh, sim similarities between the sequences and also between the genes that were uh, harboring the, the most important SNPs, the SNPs that explain the, the, the higher significant, uh, the, the higher proportion of the genetic variance. And we found, found some interesting results. There were some, some genes that were always present for the three species in the, in the two different traits. And those are strong candidates to be involved in the, in the, in, in the, in the trait regulation or trait differences, trait variation, sorry. We also did some uh, uh, functional genomic studies. Uh, this is the, the typical RNA seq study. This is in collaboration with the Roslin Institute, with the group of Ross Houston. We did some uh, comparisons between. Uh, two points of infection at three days and, and nine, nine days in two, two organs, liver and head kidney. And we found the, the obvious uh, different genes, several genes involved in, in, in immune response as uh, overexpressed or upregulated uh, during the infection process. Uh, for example, lysosome, uh, lectins, complement, toll-like receptors or toll-like uh, genes, interferons, uh, cytokines, interleukin, TNF, etc. Oh, sorry. We did the same for the for the sea lice resistance. We have a paper in G genetic selection and evolution in which we shown the increase in accuracy for different strategies of genomic selection compared to pedigree blab, uh, G blab, base and lasso, base C, all of them were uh, superior to, to the conventional pedigree blab uh, uh, approach. And we also did uh, some comparative genomic analysis between the regions that uh, were explained in more than 1% of the genetic variance for each trait in the two species, Atlantic salmon and rainbow trout, and we found some interesting regions here in green, you have Atlantic salmon chromosomes, associated chromosomes, and in, in, in orange, you have uh, rainbow trout chromosomes. Here, there are some regions that present some, some synteny between, between species uh, in associated regions. Uh, but the relationships in terms of the genes are, is not too obvious. We also did some uh, whole genome sequencing of resistant and susceptible fish, and also some RNA-seq to uh, further investigate two QTLs that we found for this uh, disease-resistant trait. We found here in chromosome 21 some uh, interesting mutations, top codons and, 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 and missense mutations that, can, that generate also some uh, differential expression of genes that are in this region. That means that there could be some uh, uh, cis-acting genes in this region, chromosome 21. And we also found another problem of the, of the Atlantic salmon genome is that 60% of the genes are not well annotated. So we found an unknown gene that presented different, different allelic expression in the QTL in the, in the chromosome 3. We have also used this, uh, this technology, <coughs> this platform of uh, SNPs or SNP, SNP chips to perform GWAS, genome-wide association studies for different traits, growth and maturation. These are the results that are published in, in different journals uh, using different strategies and different uh, densities of SNPs. We started with, with 6K uh, SNP density then, the, for example, for Atlantic Salmon, we moved to uh, imputation 
up to 150K using Bayesian, Bayesian approaches for growth. And uh, we have also used a single step GBLAB uh, using a medium density uh, SNP array to uncover the, the genes or the regions involved in growth in rainbow trout. But most of them are polygenic uh, in nature. Most of the traits that we have studied up to now are polygenic in nature, so <coughs> genomic selection is the way to go if we want to increase the, uh, the, the, the selection response for these particular traits. We have been, so, uh, we have been kind of lucky with this, uh, with this particular trait, flesh color, is controlled by, by two uh, QTL of big, big, big and moderate effect one in chromosome 14 and the other one in chromosome 27. Sorry, 26. Some of the traits are controlled by few loci as uh, flesh color. We have also used this, uh, these platforms to study selection signatures. For example, we have, this is a nice opportunity that we have in fish. We have a wild population from North America and which is the origin of the population farm in Chile. We know the origin of the farm population, so we can take wild fish and farm fish and compare them in order to find uh, selection, selection signatures. This is a recent paper from, from our group that uh, found some genes associated with growth, reproduction, behavior, immune system, and environmental stimul stimulus, uh, mainly photoperiod, uh, when we when we uh, assess selection signatures using different methods in Atlantic salmon, comparing wild versus uh, captive populations. We don't produce tilapia in Chile, but uh, we know that it's very important for the, for, 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 uh, for, for the Americas. Uh, there are some important companies producing tilapia in, in Costa Rica and also here in Brazil. So we started a project to, 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 to build a SNP array, in this time using Illumina technology for Nile tilapia. Uh, the, main, the main highlights of this, this project that or is already done, we ended uh, with this project a couple of months ago. We discovered we have, we have a 30 million SNP panel. Uh, we, we, hold, we did some whole genome resequencing of different fish from different locations. We built a 50K uh, Illumina SNP panel. We found or we confirmed uh, the sex marker or, or the sex determination gene in this species. And we also uh, shown the implementation of uh, low cost genomic selection in this species. These are some details of the, of the, of the project. We did some whole genome sequencing uh, or resequencing of uh, 30. Uh, sorry, three, 326 fish from three Nile tilapia breeding populations, two from Costa Rica and one from, from Brazil. Uh, we used Illumina technology, HiSec 2500. Uh, we ran 68 lanes of HiSec 2000, uh, about five, five fish uh, per lane in a 10x coverage uh, depth and we use uh, an assembly that was recently released by, by University of Maryland to, to perform the SNP discovery. This is this, the, the, the study design. We used uh, fish from different populations, Supra from Costa Rica and Turbo from Costa Rica, and we also used uh, gift-based uh, population from Brazil. Uh, we tried to balance between females and males to to try to confirm the, the, the sex determining gene or sex determining region. Uh, we ended up, after the, the SNP discovery phase or the variant discovery phase, we ended up with 38 million uh, variants in which almost 80% of these variants were SNPs. We filtered uh, the SNPs to perform GWAST uh, for sex determining region. This is basically a binary, binary genome wide association study for males and females, and uh, these are the three populations in the PCA using uh, uh, 2.5 uh, million SNPs. So as you can see here, 
there is uh, considerable genetic uh, differentiation between the populations, even though all of them uh, came from the same origin, gift tilapia, uh, tilapia gift. Mm. Uh, but they have been selected independently for more than, more than 10 generations. Mm. So we are confirming here the genetic differentiation of the strains, the three different strains, and we perform a genome-wide association study for sex deter determination region using 2.5 million SNPs. We found uh, this is part of a PhD uh, thesis uh, uh, carried out by, by Giovanna Cáceres in, in the University of Chile. She found this region here with uh, 28, I think, SNPs associated here in chromosome 29. 23, sorry, and uh, 10 of these SNPs are uh, hitting this gene, which is called the anti-Mullerian uh, hormone, which is involved in, 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 in the early uh, developmental stages of, of reproductive tissue. So it's a strong, very strong candidate for, for, for sex determination in, in Nile tilapia, in three Nile tilapia farm populations. We also did uh, with, uh, with this, the same data, we did uh, uh, GWAS for, for, for growth. And uh, as in the other species, it's, uh, this trait is mainly polygenic. But here, we found, an, uh, Giovanna found an in interesting region, which is uh, a region that harbored uh, th three, three strong candidate genes, delta fatty acid, uh, acyl desaturase, leptin, and growth hormone receptor. So maybe there is something interesting here. Uh, but uh, this trait is, is, is mainly polygenic. After that, we decided to move forward with the, with the 50K SNP array development. We put a lot, uh, some, some filters. We started with uh, 30 million SNPs. We filtered by quality, Mendelian errors, call rate, math, minor allele frequency, Hardy Weinberg, etc. We also did some uh, specific filtering for different populations. We filter by Illumina score, unique position, and also evenly spaced window, uh, one SNP per 12 kilo, kilo basis, and we ended up with this 50K SNP array that is already available for, for Nile tilapia. This is the position of, I'm sorry, this is the number of SNPs and, uh, and the, uh, against the chromosome length that is showing an uh, even distribution of, of, of uh, of markers across the chromosomes. Something weird is happening here, chromosome uh, 3B, uh, but this chromosome is uh, not well assembled according to, to, the, to the people that uh, did the, the last uh, genome assembly for this species. We have used this uh, SNP uh, chip to, uh, to prove that uh, low-cost genomic selection is feasible in uh, uh, Nile tilapia. This is uh, work uh, performed by a postdoc in, in, in our lab, uh, Graciela Yoshida. Uh, she did some genome-wide association studies for uh, fillet yield and harvest weight, again, uh, very polygenic traits. And uh, she also tested uh, different uh, densities of markers to, uh, to test the increase in, in, in accuracy when we compared genomic selection or genomic, genomic predictions against uh, pedigree selection or pe pedigree blab. These are the two genotypes. We have uh, three different, I'm sorry, four different density, densities, 32K, um, 32K, this is 3K, 1K, and 0.5K. So 500 SNPs, 3,000, uh, 1,000 SNPs, and 3,000 SNPs. If we use the two genotypes, the accuracy is decreasing for the two traits. It's decreasing uh, when we decrease the, the, the amount of, uh, the density of genotypes. But if we use imputation, we can reach actually similar levels of accuracy when using the, the, the high density or the denser SNP panel. Hmm? So these are the difference of imputation, the accuracy of imputation using the three different densities. This is 3K, 1K, and 0.5K. So the, 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 the accuracy of imputation is decreasing when, uh, is decreasing when we increase the, the, the density of the low density, lower density panel. 
this work is already accepted in G3 genes, uh, genomes and genetics, so it will be out uh, very, very, very soon. In terms of the future, di future directions, um, there is uh, regulation of uh, expression, right? The biology is not that easy, uh, so there is regulation of expression, gene expression at different levels, uh, and now we have different uh, levels at which we should investigate further the, the, the biology of these traits. Uh, this is what is happening, uh, or what happened with, with ENCODE project, uh, FANG, FANG project, and we've, we have uh, started a collaborative initiative within the Salmon community, which is called FASTG. It's not that uh, original, right? It's similar to FANG. Uh, but is, this initiative uh, is aiming at the functional annotation of all Salmon genomes. Uh, there is uh, there is people from from different countries that are working on this initiative, and uh, the main objective is is to to provide more information about the the annotation of of of, of the genes within the the, the different salmon species uh, genomes. Why functional studies? Why do we need functional studies? The I have two answers for that. In, uh, there is uh, a paper here in G, uh, Genetic Selection and Evolution from 2015 that is showing that if we incorporate functional uh, information, causal mutations, we can maximize the accuracy of genomic predictions. Mm -hmm. If we know the QTNs or the, the causative variants, we can increase, and we use this information for genomic predictions, we can increase, for example, the accuracies, if the traits are controlled by 20 QTNs, with pedigree blab, blab we have 38.38% accuracy, 0.28 using rat sequencing strategy, 0.45 if we have medium density array, 7.5K array. If we move to uh, high density SNP array, we have 0.45. If we have sequence data, we, we move a little bit to 0.49. But if we use the actual causative SNPs, in this case 20 SNPs, we reach uh, an accuracy of 0.98. Okay, so if we take these 20 SNPs, we can reach uh, a maximum accuracy. And this is the same for 100, these are simulation studies, of course. This is the same for 100 SNPs. If we capture those 100 causative mutations for one particular trait, we can reach a maximum accuracy. Uh, this is mainly not true for polygenic traits, but here Miguel Perez and Ciso did the same with 1,000 QTLs, and the results are similar. The accuracy is uh, almost the unity when the, we use uh, causative mutations uh, compared when we use uh, high-density SNP array, sequence data, or QTL data. John Hickey already talked about this, uh, but this is the second reason that we should go for functional studies and uh, is, is related with that uh, we can accelerate the genetic progress using gene editing technology, for, for instance, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology, uh, using the strategy proposed by, by John, potential of promotion, uh, promotion of alleles by genome editing to improve uh, polygenic traits in, in, in livestock and aquaculture. So there are two reasons for going or moving to, to functional studies. In terms of conclu conclusions, conclusions, we can say that food safety, uh, mainly protein safety, right, will depend on the increase of aquaculture production. FAO is saying this. I'm not the guy that I'm saying this. Uh, FAO is, is the, the organization that said this. SNP panels have helped to, uh, in uncovering the genetic basis of economically important traits in salmon and trout aquaculture. Genomic predictions will accelerate the genetic progress for disease-resistant traits, another important, economically important traits in Chilean uh, trout and salmon aquaculture. And the same technology, we have demonstrated that the same technology is suitable for other aquaculture species like uh, tilapia, Nile tilapia. Uh, so we can translate this, uh, these strategies to, to, to freshwater species. 
And functional studies will be crucial to increase the rate of genetic gain in, in the near future. So just uh, uh, to do some, some to, to, to provide some, some advice, some, some advice. Uh, I'm organizing this uh, international symposium on genetics in aquaculture uh, in Puerto Varas in 2021. The areas are biotechnology and functional genomics, sex control, genomic predictions, uh, breeding and quantitative genetics, industry, genetics application, gene editing, genetics of disease and stress, genetics of nutrition, epigenetics, genomes and metabiomes, and population genetics. If you are interested in this, uh, in attending to this, this Congress, please come to Chile, uh, Puerto Varas, nice city uh, in the south of Chile, uh, November 2021, so save the date for this event. And finally, I would like to thank to all of the funders and collaborators, uh, Roberto Caballero, who is here, uh, seated here, uh, but this is part of, 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 of a work from uh, different, different people uh, from the university and also for, from the industry side. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have a busy schedule today for this afternoon. I would like to invite my friend John Cole. Where are you, John? John is the director of Animal Genomics and Improvement Lab in, in uh, Animal Research Center there in Beltsville, uh, USDA, and a long-time friend. Okay. Ready? Um, good afternoon. I appreciate everyone taking the time to be here uh, today. And uh, it's always wonderful to be in Brazil. I will try to stay on time. So if I'm looking at my phone, it is not to look at Twitter. It is to see if, uh, if I'm going to go late. Um, and I asked our host, when Bento was kind enough to invite me, um, I said, well, what, what should I talk about? Because he gave me a title. But it was not very specific. And he said, Hey, guy, come on. You'll think of something. So I have a number of things to talk about. Uh, some of them reflect things that I'm interested in. And I've also, like, I, I talked with, somebody, with, the, with some of the other speakers, like Allison and Jerry, to try to make sure that we're not all saying the same things over and over again. So uh, I'm responsible for what's in the talk, so don't blame Jerry or Allison for, for anything I say. But um, we're try I'm trying to have new things to say so that everybody stays interested. And it is, um, so my general topic here is uh, to explain how biotechnology is a driver of change in the dairy industry. And I don't think that's really a controversial statement uh, at all, but uh, so I have lots of things along those lines to talk about. So first, I'm just going to provide a, a little bit of discussion about you know, the, the need for change. And some of the things I say may seem obvious, but I hope some of them help people put things in a, in a different light. And so uh, in a certain sense, we think about two kinds of change when we talk about this. Um, especially in, in agriculture, we've often had technological change. So we've had uh, developments, say, uh, moving from human-powered planting and harvesting to uh, mechanization, where we had machines that helped us get more output for each unit of input. So that, that's, in, in a way, an old sort of change that we're all used to. And then we have uh, change driven by biotechnology. And I know Allison talked about it a little bit this morning, and I said to myself, well, what is biotechnology? Because I think that if yesterday we had asked everybody to write down on a piece of paper what they think biotechnology is, we'd probably have 200 sort of different answers about it. So I asked Google, uh, as one does, and uh, Google gave actually a similar uh, definition to what I think Allison was using this morning, which is basically we're using biological processes or knowledge from biological processes um, for, here they said industrial and, and other purposes. For our case, it's agricultural uh, purposes, of course. And right at the beginning, because I'm talking about change, uh, I, I want to make an important point. 
because at least in the dairy sector where we have a, a very long history um, of programs, in a certain sense we've become used to things getting better over time. By getting better things we're more productive, we're more efficient, um, we're able to have desirable changes in our industry. We produce more food for people. We use less inputs to do it. But change in a certain sense is neutral and just because we make changes does not mean that changes are guaranteed to produce the outcomes that we want. Um, you know, maybe I shouldn't say that politics is a good example of changes, but I'm just going to say that my hair wasn't white two years ago. And uh, we had some change in the U.S. And, you know, I'll leave it to other people to say if it's good change or bad change. But I think we always need to keep this in mind. When we're making changes, we do our research, we talk to our producers, we talk to consumers, and we try to make the change positive. But that's not, there's no law of the universe that says things are going to be better. And all of the changes we make result from individual decisions. Okay, so a farmer decides, I'm going to invest in this new milking system because that will let me operate my farm more efficiently. I will have more time to spend in other activities and maybe I'll make more money. Or if I make more money, I can hire more people or I can buy more cows. But uh, these are decisions that individuals make. They're not necessarily decisions that, that are given down by um, you know, the government or whatever. And I enjoyed the discussion from this morning about the beef sector because obviously there are signals in the markets. In other words, a certain degree of body condition is desirable. So there are price signals that come from the market. But it's not, it's not a law, it's not a rule that you have to reach this end point. It's just that if you reach the end points that are desirable to the manufacturing sector, then both of you benefit and maybe you get a, a quality premium or some differential payment for it. But it's still decisions made by each, each farmer, how to feed their cows, how to manage their cows, all of that. And at the end of the day, we have to have data if we're going to make good decisions. Um, because maybe a little bit later in the talk, I'm going to respectfully disagree with something that John said uh, this morning, um, although I don't think we actually disagree that much. Now, I, I'm not, I know some folks here have been to the U.S., maybe some folks haven't. Our dairy sector is actually quite uh, very large, and so there's a lot of variation. So if you look on your left, you'll see an example of a small farm. You might see this in the Midwest or in the Northeast part of the U.S. Uh, typically, say 50 cows, 100 cows. They may be on pasture part of the time. Um, versus on the right, you'll see that's a, a farm that's North Florida Holsteins, which is in the, the state of Florida. So it's in the southern part of the U.S. near the Gulf Coast. They have 10,000 Holsteins. Very progressive. They use uh, lots of technology very aggressively. And uh, do I have that? Uh oh. Do I have the top? Ah, oh, sorry. And here, th there are two or three of these tankers every day that leave North Florida Holsteins to go to the plant uh, with milk. So, 10,000 cows make a lot of milk. But one one of the things we enjoy in the dairy sector is that we have a very long history of adoption of technology by the farmers, uh, and some of that has been discussed earlier in the day. So everything from the use of artificial insemination, uh, the use of embryo transfer in the U.S. for dairy has been growing very rapidly in the last few years. Uh, of course, genom um, you know, genomic testing, um, radio frequency ID tags and the ear tags so that the uh, computer can remotely read the cow's information when she goes into the milking parlor. And in the, the top right photograph, I'll talk about that in uh, on the next slide. But even things like milking machines, um, particularly the newer milking systems that have a lot of sensors built in, uh, and increasingly the use of robots uh, in the U.S. I think at this point it's a six to eight month wait if you want a milking robot installed on your farm because you have to wait in line behind everybody else. Uh, the top left photograph here is an actual photo from our laboratory from, I think this was taken in the 1940s. Uh, and this was, uh, used to be down in downtown Washington, D.C. And there were more than 100 clerks who worked in the laboratory. 
and farmers all over the U.S. would record milk production and other information about their cows, and they would send it in the mail. And that all got transcribed into, uh, that was our database uh, for many years. Uh, on the right, this very unimpressive looking uh, photograph is now what our database looks like. So we went from having something like 120 people working for our group to I think at the moment there are nine of us. So uh, that's an example of change. Fewer people can get more done. Uh, I'm not sure about the people who used to have a job and don't have a job. Uh, they might not feel that that's perfect. Um, and then those data, okay, all that information that farmers mailed in from all over the United States um, then fed into our genetic improvement program. And, um, you know, starting, um, you know, all the way, but, well, I mean, I, I, won't, I, will, I won't say starting with Mendel simply because, you know, Mendel did fundamental work, but then nobody read it. See, this is for the students, always read the literature. Um, and, you know, all the way down through Fisher's work and Sewell Wright's work, Wright was a geneticist um, for USDA before he went to Chicago and got famous. We, he, used to, he did some inbreeding work with our cattle, then you know, selection index work, Henderson's work, all the way through genomic selection. So at the root of all of that was the fact that we had a system for collecting information about the animals, and then we developed a system to use that information to rank animals and then to make selection decisions. And this is similar to a slide that Allison showed this morning. I think I recognize that slide because I think that their data might have come from us. But I mean, they're, they're, you know, a lot of these slides are similar. We have a lot fewer cows, they make a lot more milk. And in a sense, that's saying we're more efficient than we were in the past. Some of you are going to notice that I'm not really going to define efficient because that also means different things to different people. And at the end of the day, um, if you look all the way over here on the left, you're going to see that. Uh, According to these studies, mil cow's milk is the most efficient uh, food stuff from farmed livestock. Allison asked me, she said, that's not on a dry matter basis, is it? I said, probably not. So it's cheating a little bit, right, because there's lots of water in milk. But uh, the point is, it, it's a good use of resources. <clears throat> and in the U.S., even though we've been generally very successful in our dairy sector, we remain under constant pressure to make changes. Um, what I want you to focus on in the, in the photo on your left is this line here that's curving up. That is the median farm size. So what that's telling us, this is from the, the last census of agriculture, the data from the brand new census of agriculture I think were just released today. So I don't have them, I'm a, a little bit behind. But the point is the farms are getting bigger every year in the US. And the figure on the right here, what it's telling you, the, the blue line is, um, is, telling, is, is telling you how much it costs to produce a kilogram of milk. So labor cost, feed cost, uh, debt service, all of these things. And what you see is that the small farms, okay, so across here is the size of the farm. The small farms have the highest costs of producing milk. And what the, the green bar is showing you, the, gray, the green bar, I, I, I don't think it's a great way to express it. They express it as, the, as, a, as, a, as a percentage. But the point is, when you compare the cost to the income, the small farms make the least amount of money per unit of milk produced, and the large farms make the most amount of money. And basically that's saying that large farms are most efficient. And um, so, that pressure is driving U.S. farmers to look for new technology, new management strategies, all sorts of things, all sorts of changes they can make to remain profitable. And uh, certainly in the U.S., that's a challenge because the milk price is low. Um, although I think Brazilian farmers may not be very sympathetic, uh, <laughs> I think the milk price here is also uh, low. So. That this is maybe where, a little bit where John and I disagree, and I think it's more of a matter of perspective than a real disagreement, but I stole a quote from uh, his colleague, Mike Coffey. Uh, you know, so, so Mike runs the genetic evaluations in, in uh, the UK, and Mike says the phenotype is king, and I'll explain why I think that. 
So we have a cal, I've put up a cal-centric model, okay, and when we're really thinking about managing our farms and making changes, at the end of the day, all of these changes are focused on the cow. So on, on, the, on, your, on your right, I put, um, I put the inputs to the cow. And we often think in a limited way about inputs. We think the feed the cow eats, or we think about the water that the cow drinks. But there's actually a lot of other things that go into the cow if we really are thinking about this, especially in the context of using biotechnology to drive change, okay? Because we're putting in feed, minerals, water. We're putting in sensors on many farms. So, so there are sensors that sit in the rumen, for example. They record rumen temperature. They record uh, rumination time, all of these sorts of things. We put, when the animal is sick and needs it, we put drugs into the cow for the purpose of improving her health. We may put hormones in. In the U.S., it is very common to do timed AI to uh, synchronized estrus uh, cycles. Um, semen is a biotechnology uh, product, particularly if we think about uh, sexed semen, which has been a dramatic, uh, driven dramatic change in our dairy industry. Replacement heifer prices are at about the lowest point they've ever been in the, in the, the history we've been keeping records for because farmers can guarantee a surplus of heifers by using sexed semen. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the use of embryo transfer is becoming more common in the U.S. as well. And then the, there are lots of outputs from the cow. So, and we have to think more, you know, broadly. Yes, there's milk and there's fat and there's protein and there's lactose, but there are also other things. There's urine and feces. Those are things that have to be managed. Um, there are greenhouse gases uh, exhaled by the cow. Um, a calf is a product of the cow. You don't get the calf if you don't have the cow. So there, there are a lot of things in the big picture uh, to be considered when we're thinking about this. And I have an equation, but I, there's a P here, I promise you, but it's white. I made a mistake. Um, when I put the slides on, my web, on our laboratory's website, it will be corrected. So P, the phenotype, is, is, the, the, is the sum, in some sense, of genetic and environmental influences. Some people want to put a G by E piece. In the U.S., it's now fashionable to talk about M, a, a management component that's somehow separate from the environment. Um, as a geneticist, I don't really understand that, but it makes the nutritionists feel good. Um, okay, so we have a component of the phenotypes we're interested in that's under genetic control. Right, and there, there's, there can be a lot of variation in the proportion of genetic control. Traits like milk yield have a relatively high degree of genetic control, say heritability of 35% or so, and some of the traits that measure the size and shape of the cow also have high heritabilities. Um, you know, other things we're interested in are more functional traits, so working life, 8%, um, utter health, 12%. Um, our highest fertility measure well, daughter pregnancy rate is 4%. Age at first calf is a little higher now, but that's a new trait. So then the rest of the variation in the phenotypes is explained by things that are not due to uh, genetics directly or they're due to an interaction between the environment and genetics. So feeding, housing, reproductive management. And uh, the point here is not that genetics is the only important factor and we don't worry about everything else. The point is all of these things need to be managed together if we're going to be successful. So is Bento, Bento, is, is the camera looking at me or can I move over here? Yeah. Okay, I move over here anyway. Um, so in this figure, the yellow rectangle is showing you what the level of, the average level of fat production in U.S. Holsteins in our base year, which was 1957. So if we had made no changes genetically and no changes to management of our animals, we, we would be at this level, a little over 200 kilograms per cow per year. And so then, then we, I tried to split it out, and so this red area is showing you the increase since 1957 that we attribute to changes in management. So better feeding, better housing, all of these things. And then the, the blue area at the top is showing you the contribution from cumulative genetic gain. And when you, when you actually, when I have the spreadsheet and I do the math, it comes out, it's uh, 
49 point something percent management and the balance is due to genetics. So it really is about a 50-50 split, at least in these data. And, and that's important because again, I'm a geneticist. I think genetics is a great investment. I suspect if you had the data set to pr the right data, you could prove that investing in genetics is the single best place to spend your money in your livestock enterprise. But, um, but that is, the environment also has to undergo continuous improvement because we should all remember, you can take the best genotype and put it in a poor environment where the animal cannot express that genetic potential. That genomics doesn't change that, biotechnology doesn't change that. We have to manage both of these together if we're going to help the farmers all over the world produce enough food for uh, nine billion people by 2050. And I, I always like to see simple examples because I'm an applied geneticist. So I asked my technician, I said, can you go in the database and find some cows from our herd in Beltsville? Just to show, right, we, we know genetics works. The previous slide says genetics works, right? We have a nice favorable trend as we select for more milk and fat. Um, so these are five cows in our herd in Beltsville, Maryland. So it's on the east coast of the U.S. Our herd is the highest producing herd in the state that's enrolled in milk recording. So it's, uh, it's, it's a government research herd, but it's well managed, well run. And so this, this is the cow, her mother, her grandmother, her great grandmother, and her great great grandmother. So this is, these are, they don't, they have different sires, but they're all in the same female line. Um, and you see over time the constant genetic improvement. Now, one of my colleagues said, well, what, what happened there? Were you just using terrible bulls? Uh, no, the genetic base changed uh, there. And I just didn't go back, uh-oh. We, we didn't go back and put these two on the same scale. So these two would shift up and you'd see a more constant line. There's not actually that big a difference between them. But I think it's also nice to have an example to, to just talk to people about with real animals that we can all picture. And um, we're doing the same things in our herd that we're telling the farmers all around the country to do. So um, I think that there's some value in that. So what, what do we actually study? I say phenotype is the thing that drives the whole system. So what, what, do, what do we do in the US? Well, in 1926, we started with milk and fat yields. There might be a few people in the room who are like me, and they're old enough that they've done Babcock fat tests, um, maybe in the laboratory, if not uh, routinely. And then in the, these were the only two traits that were evaluated in the US for dairy cattle for many, many years. So in the 70s, we added a whole list of traits associated with the size and shape of the animal. Our colleagues who are in the registered cattle community are very interested in these traits. Um, there are some interesting papers in the literature that tell you what the correlation is of those confirmation traits with efficiency and productivity. I will leave it as an exercise to the student to go look at those papers. It's low, but people like to have them. We added protein yield, crude protein in 78, and then over time you'll see we've added many more traits. And you'll notice the traits we've been adding, say, since the mid-90s are not related to the productivity of the animal in the sense of milk volume or milk solids, they're related to fitness. So they're related to fertility, longevity, the health of the animal, um, these sorts of things. And that's because in the US, in the US dairy sector, those things have increasing value to the farmer. So we've put those in. And in fact, I don't show it in this presentation, but milk, volume has a zero weight in our selection index. So we're not really interested in making more milk. We're interested in making uh, more protein and more fat. And then there are lots and lots of other things that can be, uh, can be measured. Um, this is not a complete list by any means, but there's all sorts of traits related to health, fertility. I need to update this because we now do have cow health evaluations. Uh, that's fairly new. Uh, greenhouse gas, improved uh, processing characteristics of the milk. So for example, related to cheese manufacture. So how long does it take for the milk to coagulate? How firm does the curd get? Uh, 
adaptation to automated milking that the Dutch will happily sell you, CRV will sell you bowls that they say do better in automated milking systems, uh, temperament, all sorts of things. So uh, now, but okay, I'm sorry, I back up. So, so I tell you that we could have evaluations for all of these traits, but we don't. And one of the reasons is, is just because you can measure something doesn't mean an actual slide is not titled well. It should say where does new information come from? Because yes, we have the phenotypes that we measure on the cows, but then there's all sorts of other information you can measure from, from all across the farm. Information related to housing, to how the animals are fed, um, what is the climate that your farm is in? You know, do you get too much rain or not enough rain? So there, there's a growing volume of information that we can gather, uh, particularly because sensors and automation make it cheap and easy to gather it. So why do we need new phenotypes, potentially? Well, the first big driver is that production economics change. And what I mean is the way the farmers get paid for their products change over time. So in the U.S. for many, many years, the farmer got paid only on the basis of how much milk went to the plant. And I think it's still that way uh, in some countries. And then component pricing came in. And what component pricing is, is that you get paid for the amount of milk that you send to the plant, and then if you have a certain level of fat or a certain level of protein, you get a bonus, right? So it's not unlike what we, we heard this morning uh, in the beef sector where if the animal has desirable, you know, the, the carcass is of the desired size and it has desirable marbling and fat cover, then the farmer gets an extra uh, incentive. So economics change and so the farmer responds by changing their animals. This is most relevant to what we're here to talk about uh, this week. Technology allows us to do things we couldn't do before. In particular, it may allow us to measure things that we couldn't make before. And once we have that information, um, I'll sort of come back to this later. Um, the big key here is that biotechnology has led to improved sensors. If you look at, say, things like the AFI farm system uh, from Israel or something like the herd navigator system from De Laval, you have all sorts of things that you can measure in line in real time about your cows that previously you had to go through special effort and additional expense to measure. Um, this helps us better understand the biology of the cow. My, my colleague, uh, Kurt Van Tassel, is famous for saying that, you know, he's interested in prediction and he doesn't care about the genes uh, because we don't need to know about them to make the prediction. He's correct, but I, I still pretend to be a biologist, so I like to understand why these things work. Kurt does, too. He was maybe... Uh, partially facetious when he said that. And we have a review paper that talks about a lot of these traits we published a few years ago. And um, when we think about dairy, the phenotypes are, are fairly, um, fairly simple. There are usually a few observations per cow per lactation. And there, there's a typically a close relationship between the phenotype and the, the trait of interest. And what I mean is, uh, and I'll show you on the next slide, where there's a breakdown between what we measure as the phenotype and uh, what the cow's doing. But say test day milk yield. Okay, the cow gave 30 kilograms of milk on the test day. It's pretty easy to understand that. Um, the fat and the protein. It's easy to transmit and store the data because the data are relatively small. And the cost of the data recording are fairly low. I mean, and down here, this is just an example from our, our database. This is a record. For, uh, for one cow on one test day. So it's how many days of milk was she, what was her fat test, what was her protein test. Uh, pretty easy to put together. But with the newer technology, we can take something like a mid-infrared spectral reading of a milk sample, and all of a sudden, I have, th then th this is a real uh, mere spectral file um, on some cows from University of Wisconsin that uh, Kent Weigel shared with me. Instead of having a single observation, say pounds of fat or pounds of milk, we now have 1,060 absorbances representing different wavelengths on the mid-infrared spectrum. Now, I'm not really sure. I'm sure folks out there are much smarter than me. I have no idea what that number really means. 
I don't know how it relates to the amount of milk the cow produced or to her fertility status or, or whatever. So we have to take these data that are now in a sense disconnected from the phenotype and we have to use fairly complicated uh, or some sort of anyway prediction model uh, to put them together. Um, they tend to be big. The files are big so they're more work to, to store them. You, you might not think that's a big deal but when you talk to the milk plant, uh, the milk laboratories, they don't like the idea of having to send these files all over the place. Um, and this last comment is not related to the spectral data, but for certain phenotypes like feed intake, where you're directly measuring how much the cow ate, it can be very expensive and take a lot of labor to record that. But, uh, you know, uh, John Hickey is absolutely right to say, let's look at what the plant guys are doing, because I was in the Netherlands a couple of years ago, and they had this machine, and they take a seedling and they put it on a belt through the machine and it measures like literally hundreds of phenotypes about the plant. I have no idea what they mean but it's, it's measuring absorbances and reflectances and weights and it's amazing. So for every, every sample they send through this machine in three minutes they get hundreds of phenotypes on that one plant. And so I think that's the kind of thing, the kind of high volume, high output system um, and, and the, in fact, this is from a, a paper on high throughput phenotyping from the plant community. And uh, the idea uh, in some, among some folks is, well, if the plant guys are doing it, why can't we do it too? And I think that this may actually be perhaps more feasible in, say, in a poultry production system or a swine production system where in some ways the environment's even more closely controlled than on a farm. But, you know, so there's, we had a workshop in 2017 about high throughput phenotyping in livestock. There's going to be a white paper one day. Um, I think it's under review. There was a symposium. Um, it might have been in, at the Dairy Science and Interval meeting in Orlando to talk about sensors and, and more data. And since we're talking about high throughput phenotyping, it means we have to talk about big data. I still don't know what big data are, except that it's data that are too big to easily work with. I mean, we had a symposium about it several years ago in the U.S., maybe 2011. There's a recent review in the journal Animal talking about precision um, livestock decision support and things. And then at the uh, American Society for Animal Science meeting last summer, they had a whole symposium on big data. And so what is big data? Well, there are some complicated models, lots of Vs, volume, velocity, variety, value. Um, some models have three Vs. I think there's a model with like nine Vs. But the point is, data are no longer simple to describe. It, it's a complicated series of factors. It's not only how much data, it's how much variety is in the data, how much variation, what's the value of the data, there are more and more sources of data because in dairy, which is a fairly traditional sector, data flowed in through the milk recording system or they perhaps came from the artificial insemination companies. There weren't very many ways for data to move, say, into the national database, at least in the U.S. And now there are dozens of private companies that are offering services to farmers that are providing new sources of data, and we really don't yet have a good way to integrate all of that information together. And uh, hopefully, I'm looking forward to, to Dan's presentation this afternoon, because when I was young, you know, now machine learning and deep learning and AI, which is not the AI you think it is, are very popular, um, in part as a way for dealing with these data and drawing inference from these data. And I took this photo off of Twitter because I thought it was entertaining. I was a student much longer ago than 2009. Uh, that might surprise you. But when I was a student, this was just regression. <laughs> and apparently now it's machine learning. So uh, I, I hope that a young person can explain to me uh, what happened there. But uh, the point is we do have a real challenge. As we have more and more data and they're more and more complicated, how do we draw, draw inference and make decisions from those data? And we are going to have to use models that are, that are in a sense more complex. Maybe some of the reasoning of the model or the logic of the model is, is almost hidden from us and we can't easily see it. 
but um, it, it's going to happen. And the, the key is farmers need ways to take all of this data and use it to make decisions. And um, it's my opinion that, it, that in the dairy sector, there's more and more data, and we have not done a good job of helping use those data to make predictions about phenotypic performance that farmers can use to make decisions. Um, and that can, you know, grouping, predicting, ch you know, changes in health, changes in breeding status, all sorts of things. And I understand that this depends on your situation. It's driven by where you are. If you have a herd of 50 cows, a dairy of 50 cows, most farmers know their animals very well. They see them every day. They're alert to changes in behavior that could indicate the cow is getting sick or she's, you know, something's changing. But if you have 10,000 cows, there's a farm in Idaho with 60,000 cows. When, when you have animals on that scale, you have to have different tools for managing those animals. And we haven't kept up with that very well. And I'll go through these next couple of slides quickly. Maybe this is just a reminder that, that in traditional schemes in dairy, um, like traditional milk recording, many, many farms participate. But the farmers choose to participate. They're not compelled to participate. It's typically low intensity phenotyping. A relatively small number of things is measured. And this system has worked very well for decades for traits that have low recording cost. But as time has changed, we've become a lot more interested in traits, uh, say things like feed efficiency. We're interested in more complex measures of fertility. So moving beyond how long the cow was open uh, to figure out her fertility. And what we're finding is um, we're looking at a new model where it's a small number of farms that are doing intensive phenotyping. And um, you know, the, the use case in the US, for example, is particularly for expensive traits, greenhouse gas emissions, feed intake, those are the two big ones. But you could also think about milk progesterone and things of that nature for assessing uh, fertility. Um, there's also, um, there's been some discussion, I, I've had some discussions with folks that this model could be a better fit for countries that don't have as well developed uh, a dairy sector instead of trying to get every farm to, to put in this technology. Maybe we have a small number of farms and they do the intensive data collection that then feeds into genetic improvement programs. Uh, I'm not here to say that that's the best answer for everybody. I'm just saying that that could work in, in some places. And you know, there's still many, many uses of biotechnology that I haven't talked about yet. So if we think of inside of the cow, right? So manipulating the cow, we can think of manipulating the, uh, the rumen, for example. It was very interesting yesterday to hear about this, the archae bacteria that make most of the methane. So can we feed the cow in a way where either the archae bacteria get knocked down or they're outcompeted by bacteria that don't produce methane and waste energy and increase emissions? Um, you know, what about feeding to alter uh, milk nutrient profiles? There's a lot of discussion in the human nutrition community about making more things more healthful, but there seems to be lots of talking and not much doing. And I think this is challenging because we know that, say, by feeding more, more forage in the diet, you can alter things like omega-3 concentrations, but there's a lot of, let's say, information out there that may not be very credible. The, the, the A2 casein haplotype gets a lot of attention. I get lots of emails and phone calls about it. But when you go to, the, and it's, it's allegedly better for human health, people who are sensitive to caseins have an easier time digesting it. But then when I go to the literature and I read the papers about this, it's not very good literature yet. I mean, there, we really do, everybody always says there's a need for more study, right? Every scientific talk ends that way. But I don't think we have enough information here yet. Um, what about ways to manipulate the animal so that we don't have to worry as much about nitrogen and phosphorus um, runoff in the environment through urine and feces? Because certainly um, in Europe and the U.S. and Canada, th that's a very big issue with how do you manage your animal waste. You can't just um, spray it like you used to. Um, there are things like sensors that measure body temperature and rumination status. Those have the potential to tell us about changes um, you know, in the cow's health, is she nearing estrus? Um, 
you know, uh, those kinds of things. Is she handling transition from calving to peak lactation well? And there, I mentioned body temperature. There are lots of other sensors too. There are pedometers, and um, then what about things we put outside of the cow? Um, you know, one of, one of my colleagues here suggested, you know, hey, one of the things you should think about is cameras. You can do a lot with cameras. You can monitor changes in the animal's behavior. So for example, ear flicking or more mucus coming um, from the nose could be an indicator of uh, onset of certain diseases. You know, we also need to think about the whole environment. Can we breed better varieties of forage and concentrate that actually complement uh, the cow's nutrient needs or, again, going back to manipulating the microbiome or reducing uh, excretions into the environment? And you could also try some of that through inoculants or feed additives. And then even think on the manufacturing side, are there things that you could do with the milk plant um, to make products more appealing to consumers. I don't know the trend in Brazil, but in the U.S. the trend continues to be people are drinking less and less milk, but they're consuming more cheese, yogurt, and other manufactured uh, products. You know, so, so maybe, maybe we need to be more open-minded about that. If they're not, folks aren't going to drink the milk, okay, how do we ensure that, that there is a demand that we can meet for dairy protein in people's diets. And then this is, this, this is the last big part of the talk. I hope I'm okay on time. Been till my phone turned off. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about genomic selection and some things related to it. So I think everybody might have seen this. This is from the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding in the US. The, the large figure is the number of Holstein genotypes we have in the national database. So in 2008, it took the entire US dairy industry to get 1,500 genotypes. Now we have more than three million, so we think that's worked out pretty well. We've seen a similar growth. This is the Jersey population. Now the, the scale is not the same, but the shape of the curve is the same. And then in the bottom right is the brown Swiss um, population, which is smaller in the US. And you see the brown Swiss going like stairs because we have ex made exchanges with other countries. So you'll see a, a jump when we made an exchange with Switzerland or with, um, with the UK or someone. So I guess the point here is we have lots and lots of genotypes. We also have lots of markers because I was a student in the 90s and uh, I was an animal breeding student and I remember how all of the money went to the molecular genetics guys. And they said, we just need 10 years and 10 million more dollars and we'll solve all the problems. You know, and it took 13 years to get 1,500 animals genotyped for 300 markers. Now those are microsatellites and it wasn't automated. Uh, and then we get to the, the development uh, of the first SNP chip. So it's 38,000 markers after edits and we got up to 16,000 animals. And since then we've seen a continuous growth in how many markers we can genotype on lots of animals at low cost. And then here I have, uh, I took this slide from Paul Van Raden. So here we have about, about 40 million variants in the, in the genome for cattle. Um, as Allison pointed out, that, you know, she, she has a, the more up-to-date number than I do. Um, it's, it's more than 1,500 animals now. And uh, I am happy to say that right before I got on the plane to come here, we signed our renewal of our participation agreement for, CD, uh, for 1,000 bull genomes. So we, we like to participate and use all those data too. So this has also been official. You know, John talked in his presentation about imputing to sequence for vast amounts of sequence data. Um, we've also imputed to sequence, not quite with the uh, you know, disregard for the cost of computing that John did, but we've been pretty happy with that too. And we, we also like to compare ourselves sometimes to the humans because the human folks keep reinventing things and they're pretending like, hey, did you know that you can use a genotype to make predictions about an individual? No, never occurred to us. <laughs> so for a long time, we had the largest database. We had more genotypes than 23andMe and Ancestry.com, but they've recently caught up with us. But I would like to point out that our genotyping is cheaper and our delivery time is faster for more loci. So the value of our service is high and the reliability of reading values is high. So, um, you know, maybe we should move into their space. That might help with my uh, lab's budget. 
Now, this may seem like a really obvious thing, but it's not always obvious to people. A single genotype can be applied to any trait in, in the particular animal that you're interested in. A genotype isn't usable only for milk or only for fertility. And, and that's an important thing. That, that's a difference between the high density SNP genotyping that we're doing and say uh, older microsatellite based genotyping where very specific things were being targeted. Um, now, we've been fortunate in dairy because we have a long history of genetic evaluation. So when it was time to do genomic evaluation, we had a historical population with high reliability breeding values, and we had a repository of DNA from those animals with high reliability breeding values so that we were able to fairly quickly launch our genomic evaluations. Um, this is slightly out of date. We've done research evaluations for heat tolerance. The Australians have real evaluations for heat tolerance. And we've done research evaluations for feed efficiency. Other countries have real evaluations for feed efficiency or feed saved, which really is kind of a combination of body weight and feed intake. But um, the point here is you can apply it to new things. And then you can also potentially use research populations or these potentially these high intensity phenotyping herds to generate genomic evaluations on a small group of animals that could then be applied to the population um, at large. Although, you know, you do always want to make sure, we always worry, is our training population representative of the wider population that we want to apply the predictions to? And it's been good for dairy farmers, we think. Um, basically, we're making more genetic progress more quickly. Uh, there is some concern about uh, inbreeding, but I'll come back to that and tell you why I think people need to calm down. And then, you know, it's been good for, uh, for the bull owners, for some of them anyway. And one of the things I think is very interesting is that when we first started doing genomic evaluations, there was, uh, the farmers kept using progeny tested bulls. They weren't convinced that the technology was really right. Well. Uh, as of this fall, 69% of all matings in the U.S. by artificial insemination in dairy are to young bulls. So once we convince the farmers that the technology is dependable, they use it. And this is very similar to what John showed earlier, although th this is from U.S. data, not from Dutch data. But I suspect if you laid the two charts on top of each other, they would be virtually identical. So we've dramatically reduced generation interval. And this is selection differential for longevity. I just picked one of the traits we reported in the paper. So you can see we're, uh, we're going faster and making more progress using uh, genomic technology than we could do without it. And then we, we, had a, we had an idea one day. We said, well, what if you could take all the best chromosomes and say, I'm going to leave this up to the, the molecular biologist to figure out how to do it. Right? Because we all know Mendelian segregation is our enemy. But uh, if you take the best chromosome one in the population all the way down to the best X chromosome, put them all together in one animal. And this is for our selection of goal, which is lifetime net merit. It would be 7,300 US dollars. That's about 28,000 reais. Now, uh, you might be saying, wow, well, do I know if that's a lot of change or not? Well, the top bull in the US from the April evaluation is at $1,065 of net merit. So based on simply the variation that exists in the population, if we can get it all together in the right place, we, we can still uh, go a lot further than we have. And uh, this is a photo because I, I mentioned Mendel a little bit earlier, very briefly. This is from Brno in the Czech Republic, and, and this is where one of Mendel's greenhouses was. So, uh, it, it, you know, as a geneticist, it was a, and there's a lovely brewery around the corner where you can get very cold beer. It has everything a scientist needs. <laughs> and um, so, so I, I would say, right, Mendel was maybe the founder of biotechnology in the agricultural sense. And uh, I mentioned inbreeding earlier. These are numbers from January of this year that I put together. I'm only going to focus on the red. Okay, the red is about young bulls. So those are the animals driving change in the population. And the solid line here is the pedigree inbreeding. So that's calculated only from the sort of theoretical relationships. The dashed line is the genomic 
inbreeding. So you can see we're, we're making the animals more related pretty quickly, um, but this dotted line is future inbreeding. And what that is is when you take these young bulls and you mate them to a random sample of cows from the population, what will the inbreeding of those calves be? So, you know, that, that's not too bad. There's, there's not a strong trend there. But uh, folks worry a lot about inbreeding. And, you know, I think folks worry too much about inbreeding because we, have, we do a lot of, say, high-intensity performance testing. So the point is when you do inbreeding with no performance testing, you have a real problem. That's when you really pile up all these harmful diseases. Then all of a sudden you're in the purebred dog world and uh, the purebred dog people don't like to be told about inbreeding. They call it line breeding because that makes it different somehow. The horse people do that too. But um, folks are worried about it and why do they worry about it? Well, they worry about it because if there are Mendelian, um, harmful Mendelian alleles segregating in your population, ramping up your rate of inbreeding is a good way to turn up these genetic defects, right? And I don't think I really need to go through the, uh, the Punnett square for everyone. You know, simple, single locus. And if you look at U.S. Holsteins as an example, we actually have a whole, a whole raft of these things that we know about. Not all of them are harmful. So red coat color is not harmful to the animal. Pold is actually probably favorable to the animal. Now, I think Allison just twitched because polled is dominant, horned is recessive. But I put it on our list as polled um, because that's the name of the gene it's associated with. And um, one of the interesting things is we continue to find these, these uh, loci. Some of them we've known about for many years. So dumps and blad and CVM are well known uh, for a long time, uh, polled red coat color. But uh, the, the one we've most recently added to the list we call HH6. It's a mutation in the SDE2 gene. And it's, it's interesting because we didn't know about it. it. The French found it. And the issue with this is it's, it occurs later in the animal's life when they go blind and they can no longer see. That, uh, that, that haplotype is in the U.S. Holstein population. Very few Holsteins in the U.S. live long enough to display the phenotype if they happen to be homozygous at that locus. But now we know about it so we can watch for it. And that's what we're trying to, to watch against. And I get asked a lot, well, wow, I mean, I think maybe all of this genomics and all of this inbreeding is a problem because we keep finding, every time I open the, the, the trade magazine, there's a new recessive that somebody's telling me about. And so it's important to, to help people understand that these mutations were there already. They, di they didn't appear because of genomics, but having lots of genotyped animals and lots of haplotypes allowed us to discover certain mutations that were already uh, existent in the population. So our ability to d detect things has improved. It's not that there's a necessarily an increase in the rate of mutation. And there's a brand new paper in Nature, I don't, ha I don't even have the citation here, it's so new, it's fascinating, because it says that um, there's a distinction between a knockout, okay, you can knock a gene out, and that does not necessarily stop expression, um, because there can, be, uh, there can be other genes in the same family that are very similar, and even though you've knocked out the gene that appears to be causal because it's homozygous and, and what have you, you don't knock out expression. I'm not describing the paper well because I, I don't, uh, it's some fairly complicated cell biology, but it's really interesting. And what it tells us is that even things we think we understand in a certain sense, like a simple Mendelian disorder, often, if even though the mode of inheritance follows this model, the mode of action biologically in the animal may sometimes be more complicated. And I think maybe I've gotten off track a little bit. We did some math on this to figure out how much it costs our farmers. We estimated about 40 million highs a year for the genetic diseases that we know about. So in reality, the cost to our farmers is greater because there are some that we don't know about. And the Technology associated with genomics allows us to detect these things, but now we then have to help the farmers make decisions using this information. 
And so uh, that's the, the thing I'm going to keep emphasizing here is that uh, the technology is important, but the, the key use of the technology is to make a decision. I'm not really going to talk much here about uh, gene editing. We did a little bit of work to say, is that a u potentially a useful way to reduce the frequency of harmful, known harmful alleles in the population? Um, I've actually sort of been changing my thinking on this. Uh, Yes, maybe, slowly, but at this point, my, at least in the U.S. population, when I compare the carrier bulls to the non-carrier bulls, the, the non-carrier bulls have equal or better genetic merit than the carriers do. So today, my answer to this question is, is I'm not going to use gene editing to get rid of these uh, harmful alleles. I'm simply getting rid of the bulls. So I won't make any more copies of those harmful alleles. And that can also work, say, for a polygenic trait like stillbirth or dystocia. And we have a big problem in the U.S. where the farmer says, dystocia is a problem for heifers. But I really like this bull, and he performs poorly, right? His daughters give birth with lots of difficulty. So I'll just breed him to a cow, not to a heifer, because it's a heifer problem but you've just made a bunch more copies of those alleles that we don't want in the population. Um, so I'll skip over that. Um, okay, now I also got, uh, John talked a lot about editing for quantitative traits. So you guys, have, and then uh, uh, Jose also talked about that in his presentation, so we won't go there. One thing I think that, that is very interesting though that hasn't been talked about as much with gene editing is the potential use of gene editing to validate uh, functional variants. Now, I say let's use it to validate. Obviously, it's not that easy. There are certain things you can validate at certain stages of development because you can do it in vitro. If you're going to go to an in vivo model where you've got to put embryos in animals and bring them to term or near term, it gets a lot more complicated. That's also completely skipping over all the complications of actually getting your edit into an embryo that you can put into a cow that establishes a pregnancy. But, but I still think, uh, maybe because I, I still think I'm a biologist, you know, this is a question. We use statistical models to identify uh, things that we think are problems. They often, there's high concordance and everything seems to match up, but we often don't actually prove it. So we haven't actually proven that CWC15, when it's knocked out, actually kills Jersey embryos. We think it does. The data appear consistent. For the Holstein haplotype 1 for HH1, okay, we know in the mouse that if you knock out APAF1, you don't get proper neural tube development and the embryos die. But we haven't actually validated that in the cow. And so I think there is potential for some of these new biotechnology tools to do that. And I think it's also important when we talk about things like when, when John was talking about his allele uh, test scheme for identifying causal variants and things. At some point, maybe it's just me, I want to actually know the biology. And then I have a last couple of slides. Um, I just want to emphasize that biotechnology is used across the lifetime of an animal. So she's born, you know, she gets vaccinated. Those are often vaccines that are the products of biotechnology. She grows up, she's bred, she's probably synchronized in the U.S. That's a biotechnology product. She gives birth, um, she transitions. We may put sensors in her, we're doing ket ketosis tests. We're monitoring her, her behavior through the transition period. Those are all products of biotechnology. She gets bred again, or she gets an embryo put in. More biotechnology, she dries off. Maybe we do dry cow therapy and put a teat sealant on. Um, so, so at basically every phase of the cow's life, until she leaves the farm, biotechnology plays a role, you know, in feeding her, breeding her, and in her production. And then I just want to maybe tie into some of the things that, a little bit that Allison talked about too, because I think it's important, okay? The reason we develop these tools and use them is because it allows us to um, more efficiently or more profitably uh, produce things. And so down here at the, at the bottom, I put the cow because I still sort of center things on the cow. We talked already about all the different inputs that go into the cow. We talked already about the many different things that come out of the cow. 
but based on these outputs, okay, the farmers can change the way they're managing the environment the cow's in. So the farmer has an important role. Um, the farmer has to contend with governing bodies who want to tell, tell them what to do and how to do it. Um, I think that can be good when it's saying that you have to have a Class A milk license so your milking parlor is clean and you have a, a chiller on your bulk tank. Uh, the milk, in this case, goes to the manufacturers. They sell things to consumers. Um, but there's lots and lots of different loops in the system. First of all, everything is constrained by this box I've drawn to indicate the environment that we're all in together. So the things that, that, that we do working in agriculture affect everybody else. And you know, whether we like it or not, we're, go we're going to be required to make changes to, to meet the, uh, the desires of consumers, even if what the consumer wants doesn't always make sense or if it's poorly informed, because you have uh, advocacy groups, right? We saw some of those folks in the movie last night. You know, they're trying to influence consumers. You should buy organic milk because that's the healthiest thing to feed your children. Um, they also try to influence the government. Oh, there needs to be a rule that you have to have this much spay, right? You can't use farrowing crates for your pigs because that's bad, you know, that's, we don't like the way it looks. You can't use battery cages for chickens. So they make changes to the farm, you know, they tell the farmers, you can use this, you can't use that. Um, and that actually feeds back up to the consumers. But uh, the point is I want to try, what I'm trying to explain here is that you know, biotechnology plays all up and down through this. Biotechnology is not limited to something that we have the farmers do to the cows. It's you know, contained and uh, it doesn't affect anybody else. There, there's this constantly changing environment that the farmers are working in, the manufacturers and processors are working in, and even the consumers are working in, right? Because even, even when even when we hear people on the airplane or something saying, I read on the internet that milk causes cancer or whatever, we need to understand that, that just like we're trying to do the best job we can do, other people are trying to do the best job they can do. And um, maybe we have the opportunity to educate people, um, find a way to educate them and interact with them in a constructive way because none of us like to be told that we're uh, foolish and nobody else does either. But I think we need to remember, this is a very, very complex environment. There's information coming at all of us at 1,000 miles an hour all the time. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, what does the farmer need? The farmer needs us to help them make a decision about their cows so that we can produce the outputs from this system that are going to be part of the solution to feeding the growing world. So biotechnology has always been an important uh, driver of change, at least in, say, the modern uh, dairy sector. Uh, genetic gains are cumulative and they're permanent. If you change the cow's diet, her production is going to change, but her genetic potential doesn't go away. Um, the array of things that we can measure about animals continues to increase as technology changing, but uh, it's not always affordable to record them on every animal, and the farmers need us to help them make decisions from all that information. And uh, we've heard a lot about the potential of gene editing. It really is pretty amazing. Um, but we're certainly in a challenging situation right now where we don't know, it's not yet clear, where we'll be able to use the technology and in what ways. And you know, so that's the important work that a lot of folks are doing to try to make that happen. I have to acknowledge uh, my funding from the US government, and we love everybody, especially you. And I think we'll have questions at the, um, the round table. And I just wanted to let folks know, the slides will be on my lab's website. They'll be on my personal website if it's, if it's hard to find Agile, but it's easier to type my name into Google. And uh, if, if anybody wants a copy here, they can also ask Bento, and I'm, I don't mind if anybody has a copy. These are free for people to use and share and um, uh, you know, pass around. Thank you. Great job. Uh, let's have a coffee break. Let's do that as short as we can, because we have these two talks to and then we go to the round table okay thank you